everyone, and welcome to Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Uh, hope you are all having a good morning so far. Uh, so I have decided, as with is, is within my purview to do, that Sunday is going to be, if I do a stream on Sunday, it's going to be something uh, different, random, well, maybe not random, but it's not going to be a TEDx. So just as a warning, this is not a TED Excellence. Um, even though you might think otherwise. Uh, you are, of course, welcome to use the bingo card, as you will. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think from now on, Sunday is just going to be something that catches my eye otherwise, or maybe work on some other project, or I might just take the day off. So Sunday is going to be a sort of a set-aside day. Um, and in that vein, uh, I came across this the other day. So uh, in the course of my channel, I have subscribed to a myriad of, of different organizational YouTube channels uh, in education, in business, uh, in counseling. Just you know, if I get uh, if I get interested in a subject for a while, or I come across uh, something that looks like might be a source for some interesting information, I'll subscribe to their YouTube channel. So I have a very long list of things I've subscribed to over the years, but I don't always check up on them that often. Uh, but I was scrolling through my list the other day. And I spotted that at some point I had subscribed to the uh, Washington Education Association YouTube channel. And I think that was probably an outgrowth of a series of videos I did many years ago uh, that you can find on my channel under a playlist called Down the Rabbit Hole, one of my earliest sort of uh, investigative series of videos on a subject. Uh, it, Admittedly, those videos are a little rough around the edges because it was still early in my in my tenure doing YouTube stuff. Not that I've you know smoothed out all that much since then, but uh, yeah. And in context with what happened in uh, Seattle this summer with the whole Chaz Chop thing, it got me thinking for a second. So I clicked on it to see what was going on at the Washington Education Association. And I came across a video titled, as you can see, Abolition and Resistance in Elementary. And I was immediately intrigued. What do those two words have to do with elementary school education? At least I assume elementary school education because that is the whole title. So I thought I would take a look at this. Now, a couple of caveats before I begin. Uh, the first eight minutes or so, okay, so the whole thing is about two hours long. I'm not doing the whole thing. The first eight minutes or so are them getting everybody uh, together in their little live stream chat room thing. So there's not much going on. So I sliced off about the first eight minutes. And I'm only uh, at most going to look at an hour's worth. But probably not even that. I'm going to go as far as the show. This show is concerned for an hour and a half at minimum, unless I get really bored somewhere in there. And at maximum, two hours if it still catches my interest. Uh, so I've set aside an hour's worth of the original presentation, which I will be very surprised if we get all the way through, given uh, past his prologue with me doing these live streams. But that should be enough for us to get the gist of what they're having to say about the subject matter. Okay, all those caveats aside, hello, everyone. Who's here with me today? Why, that would be Jordan Herbert. Hello, St. Michael. Hello, Jaeger Pony. Hello, Anakin Plays. Hello, Dark Alisle. Hello, Mark. My, Mark. Mike R. Hello, 2002 Chrysler PT Cruiser Woody. Hello, Advocatus Diaboli. Hello, uh, Midrin Emrys. Emrys? I'm probably screwing that up. Hello, uh, No Name. Hello. And who else is here? Chaos X, hello. Dina B, hello. No Room for Squares, hello. Pip Bin, hello. Corey Suzuki, hello. Zan Wild, hello. Pink Hollow, the Driving Ape Man, hello. What's His Face McWhatnot, hello. Mike Savage, Blarg. This is Kyle, thank you so much. Hello, chat people and scribbles. Hello, Kyle. Eric Grunstadter, hello. L. Wolf, hello. Uh, Brutus, hello. Uh, Rick Ashbringer, hello. Uh, Dr. Black Crow, hello. The Gun Hammer, hello. Grillin' Pete. Grillin' Pirate Pete, hello. My brain's still waking up, guys. I only got up a couple hours ago. Truckin' Bear, hello. Irate Prostate, hello. And Raziel, hello. I think that's everybody. Lurking Gopher, hello. Okay, I don't want to leave anybody out right in the beginning, but we do have to move on. So, guys, per usual, I'll start off with a few seconds for sound test. You guys tell me if you can hear it. And then we will proceed. It starts rather suddenly because I had to, like, like I say, get right to the beginning. So here we go. And 
everyone. I guess I should introduce myself. Some of you don't know who I am. Um, I don't. My name is Stephanie Gallardo Lana. I'm an NEA director for the state of Washington. I serve you all in Washington, D.C., as well as on the WEA board here in Washington State. Okay, so director, director of WEA, working in D.C., uh, emissary, etc., cetera, or uh, ambassador of a kind. All right, so somebody important. That's that's the important thing. I want to know who who people are, what they do, and how they fit into the whole picture. And um, I'm a high school teacher oh. at Tequila. I teach social studies and ELL. Okay. Um, and I love what I do. It's also hella hard. <laughs> <laughs> so before we um, continue on with what we're planning to discuss today, mm -hmm. we uh, need to do our land acknowledgement. And so I'm going to share with you all a video that um, one of our NEA director elects uh, created for us. Her name is Stephanie Urban. She comes from Spokane. Our land acknowledgement. Sounds so procedural, doesn't it? Our land acknowledgement. Wow, thank you, Midrin Emrys. I hope I'm saying that right. Thank you so much. Why is this woman talking to us about resistance with BLM imagery? Why is she daring to white splain and usurp a position that should be filled by a brave woman of color who is also LGBTQ plus and disabled? Uh, you know, I, I, I think we will learn that as we go. And, uh, is she, I, I don't, well, I mean, she's, you know, this is, this is the really sort of uncomfortable thing about all of this. I don't care about someone's ethnicity. I don't care about their skin color. I don't care about all of that, but be, because they make it relevant to the whole thing all the time. I, I then have to focus on these things, even though I don't care, right? So uh, no, I'm, not, I'm not complaining to you, Midran. It just, it's just one of those things where it's like, I, uh, it just causes me to cringe inside every time that it has to become relevant for no good reason, you know? That's why that squares on the bingo card, bringing up race, sex, et cetera, for no reason. It seems to be a common thread these days. But thank you so much. Thank you, Drew W. She's already on my nerves for having that high inflection every sentence like she's always asking a question. I I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm just inured to a lot of um, uh, a lot of verbal tics or whatever at this point. I just I just want to know what is our land acknowledgement going to be? It, it, and again, doesn't that sound so procedural? It's like, okay, now we have to do the land acknowledgement. Like, okay, you do that. Uh, Okay, I don't know what what happens next year, so we'll see. What I, I, if something starts, it's going to have like music to it. I may have to skip over that part just because I don't know if it's going to be copyrighted or something. Just as a warning, because these these are live, and I don't know what the what the plan is. So, and I'm going to share my screen with you all so that you can see. Okay, I'm I'm waiting to see. Frank, can you go ahead and? Allow me to share screen, please. <laughs> oh boy, technical difficulties. Live TV, everybody. Uh, yes. Got it, thank you. Okay. Here we go. Oh, wait, wait. They have a pre-planned saved land acknowledgement for presentations. You couldn't just do it yourself? Wow. Okay. This is this is news to me. I didn't know that there was like course material for a land acknowledgement. That's that's amazing. Okay. So we're getting two and one, guys. This is this is very Inception. Uh, guys. Hold on. I have to fix my. Okay. Ever since colonizers have reached our shore. Ever since what? Oh boy. Okay, guys. Like White I said. Hustle help. Yeah, yeah. And shot each squeeze on the bottom. What? Hello, everyone. Good day. My okay. name is Stephanie Urban. Uh huh. Ever since colonizers have reached our shores, right. there has been a documented history of alliances formed between Black and Indigenous people. There have been countless lives lost. What? Wait, wait, wait. Black and Indigenous people alliances since colonizers reached our shores. I, I I don't know the history of Washington State in that regard, so I'm not I'm not sure 
Okay. Um, yeah. So it sounds a little divisive, but then what do I know? Or the fear of these alliances formed between black and native lives. We must continue to form these alliances. We must what? continue to have bold conversation. What? We must continue to lead and to form a path for people to follow so that we together can uplift our children and our grandchildren. Okay, that we together can uplift our children and our grandchildren, black and native people, Al allied alliances. Uh, okay, and this is a land acknowledgement, you said? This doesn't sound like a land acknowledgement so much as it sounds like, well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to you. Right now, I would like to take a minute to recognize the unrecognized. Okay. I I'm going to skip over this, guys. The, the audio is terrible uh, with the, the overlay and everything, so I'm going to skip ahead past this. I'm sorry. If you'd like to see the whole thing, the link is in the description. Uh, I, I wanted to get to the subject matter of the actual talk here rather than whatever that is. So apologies for that. I wasn't sure what was going to happen there. Let's uh, move forward. Okay, um, we just want to thank Stephanie for contributing this um, amazing land acknowledgement video. Uh -huh. um, we're so grateful and we're so excited to welcome her onto the any board of directors. Oh, um, so just to so, so the lady who's promoting alliances <clears throat> between black and native people and everybody else is a colonizer is on the board of directors for the Washington Education Association. Okay. To give a little bit of background for folks who are joining us for the first time. Sure. I like background. This happened last time. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I didn't know how to close out of my screen. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. This is almost like Ranting Monkey is running this show or something. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> to give you background... Um, we started uh, constructing and uh, crafting these sessions um, together with the other 14 panelists um, just about maybe a month and a half ago, maybe a little bit longer. Okay. And it resulted um, because of um, just the intense nature of the time that we were living in and mm -hmm. also like the deep, deep turmoil that um, many of us, especially our black panelists, um, have been experiencing as a result of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor's death and um, the years long Black Lives Matter movement. Uh huh. And so um, we basically just thought that it would be a good idea and something that could bring a healing process and also a process of learning um, for a lot of our members to have this type of session, um, these types of sessions. Sessions, like counseling sessions. What I, again, I'm going off of the title here uh, Abolition and Resistance in Elementary. So are these, what, like group therapy sessions or something? Um, especially so that we could get um, early career educators in on um, the movement, right? Right. Get educators in on the movement. So an agenda-driven educational curriculum rather than an academic-driven educational curriculum in elementary school, at least again, from the title. So that, is that what I'm to understand? And part of why we decided to do these sessions was also so that we could put uh, BIPOC educators, women and non-binary non educators at the center and forefront of the conversations. Because of their gender and or skin color? Not, not because of their education or experience? Okay. Um, because that's what the work is right now in WEA. Is the work, magic words, the work. I have a whole video from uh, Curriculum of Fear way back in the in the day called the work because it's said almost as sort of this reverent idea, like a mission or something. The work, this work, the work that we do, etc. Is trying to uplift and center those voices because for so long in WEA they have not been. Um, positioned in the place where they should be uh, as a result of many different things, such as... Where they should be. Should. For no other reason than their gender and or their skin color. Got it. 
barriers, the racism, and, you know, we could go into like a long slew, but uh-huh. now we're at a place, we're at a point um, in our, in our situation as a union um, that we are moving forward. And um, honestly, we are claiming the power that we have and deserve and we're doing what we got to do. Oh, well, you're doing what you got to do. Claim the power that you deserve. Okay. So that's that. And that's why we're doing the <laughs> sessions. Yeah. And you say you're moving forward. Isn't, I don't know, elevating people or dividing people up by sex and or race kind of moving backward? Or is that just me? Uh, thank you for calling the driving eight man. Isn't that the definition of indoctrination? Um, I know, you know, definitions, who cares about what words actually mean anymore or, or anything like that. We, we, we have a movement to move, I guess. Thank you, Piccolo. Um, and I just want to thank the panelists for being here today. Um, Zenobia is here for the second time. Um, so I'm going to ask her to introduce herself first, and then we can have each of the panelists introduce themselves. So Go ahead, Zenobia, take it away. Thank you, Estefa. Um, my name is Zenobia Clark. Mm-hmm. I am a second grade teacher at a dual language school in the Highline School District, so south of Seattle. Okay. This is my sixth year teaching, which is really weird because that means I'm no longer an early career educator, like I'm moving away. And it's very exciting because that means I broke that statistic and I did not leave as an educator of color. Okay. I, I don't know what the statistics are, but okay. Second grade uh, teacher, uh, dual language. All right. Although it's um, it's touch and go like every day. It's really hard. I also sit on the WA board of directors uh-huh. as well as the Highline exec committee and the Rainier Unicert council directors. Okay. Uh, gosh, what else? I got a dog. I love him. I got a wife and Alex snacks. <laughs> I'm sorry. You mention she mentions her dog and her wife in the same tone of voice, one before the other. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. Okay. Someone else. Uh, let's go with Emma. Go. Oh, yeah. My name's Emma Caro, she, her, hers. Oh, pronouns. Okay, well, I, 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 I am edified. I am a first, I just finished my first year teaching, which was a whole year, but we did it. Um, I'm also working in Highline School District dual language teaching on the Spanish side for second grade alongside Synovia. Okay. On the same grade level team. Yes, I saw I, okay. And in the lit- elementary literacy adoption committee, I have uh, also just joined the ATA um, rep for the building with, along with Zenobia and our friend Amelia. Um, I like to read, I like to go to the beach and be in the water. I love summer, so <laughs> I'm so glad that it's finally sunny. Very cute. And I'm so thankful for everybody showing up here and whoever helped this create this as well. Uh, thank you again, Midrin. Very generous of you. Uh, women are earning 60% of college degrees. They are 85% of elementary teachers, 68% of secondary teachers, 58% of school administrators. In another decade, they'll be the lead in college professors, but oppressed. Uh, well, whenever I hear these 60% of college degrees, I always ask the question, college degrees in what? Because I uh, Many, 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 many times in videos, I've seen uh, arguments saying, you know, in, in regards to the wage gap, uh, particularly, those uh, people will say, you know, here's uh, women make 70% of what men do, and yet they earn over 50% of college degrees and things. And I'm like, well, college degrees in what subjects? Because then if they're getting degrees in English, which I have absolutely no experience myself, they're probably not entering into a uh, industry or workforce that is as high paying as someone who has a uh, engineering degree or a uh, biochemistry degree or something like that. So that statistic always makes me kind of go, eh. but uh, yeah, there's uh, there was another uh, chart I saw a long time ago. It's probably changed quite a bit since then, 
uh, where someone was trying to prove that women, uh, well, on the one hand, that, that women were being denied opportunities, and yet they showed a graph that said uh, that women were becoming the larger portion of the primary breadwinners for families over time. And I thought, well, if they're becoming the primary breadwinners for families, then they must be working and earning quite a bit of money as related to men. So what? But uh, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see what they have to say. Thank you again, Midran. Re really appreciate it. Thank you, Chicago Mike. She loves long walks on the beach. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess at a certain point, you try to tell about yourself and you get into like dating video territory, but okay, all seem like nice people. I'm, I'm, I want to get to the point where they start talking about what we're here for, or at least purportedly here for. Hey, Grandma. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm Caitlin Kamalay Brandon. You can call me Caitlin or Kamalay. Kamalay okay. is my Hawaiian name, so I can go with uh, go by either or. Okay. Um, I am. I was a grades two, three ELA and ethnic studies teacher at Leshai Elementary in Seattle School District. I'm mm -hmm. moving back down to my little ones, which is my favorite place to be, and teaching either kindergarten or first grade next year. Okay. Um, it is. Um, it is my third year teaching, mm -hmm. which is really exciting. Um, I also serve on the WA board with Zenovia and Estefa. I serve on the Seattle um, Education association board as well um and then i've served as uh, interim director interim program manager and a racial equity coach for the center for racial equity in seattle racial equity coach racial equity center okay interesting now i'm glad for i mean now i, I think our most elder individual here has been doing this for six years but i'm kind of glad that all of these teachers so far are relatively new which means that their training, their education towards becoming a teacher uh, occurred within the last, like just the last few years or so, where a lot of the changes in rhetoric and the movements that I've been peripherally, you know, keeping an eye on have been, I, I assume, been used more so than not. So I'm curious to find out what uh, new teachers, rather than like old and I'm not, you know, doing an age thing, but just like people have been entrenched in older uh, schools of thought when it comes to education. I'm curious to see what the the most recent generation is having to say about things. Just a little Thank something. <laughs> Thank you so much to our three panelists. Welcome. Woo! Woo! So, um, I, okay, so we are going to get into some of our questions that we have for the panelists. Okay, good. Um, Please. The first one I kind of want to start with is just the concept, or I guess it's a misconception that um, elementary school is not a place where justice or resistance work can happen. Oh, well, okay, we're getting right into it. Justice and resistance work in elementary school. All right. Well, uh, I hope they define what they mean by justice and resistance work, because I would love to be able to assess that in relation to educating small children, as I'm cringing a little bit in my face, which you can't see right now, but yeah. And I think back to my experience when I was in um, my teacher ed program, and one of the main reasons that I chose to do a secondary pathway mm -hmm. was because I had this preconceived notion that elementary teachers could not do real deep resistance work with young people or with the little ones. What is resistance work? What do you mean? These are the questions I have. I hope they define their terms because otherwise I'm going to be stumbling around and assuming the worst, whether I'm right or not. Um, and so that's kind of why I chose the path that I chose. Obviously now, some years later, I realized that that is a bunch of BS and that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. But I guess we'll just start with, you know, what was y'all's elementary school experience like and kind of how did you arrive at um, where you are today as elementary school teachers? You better name somebody off first or else everybody's going to be scrambling to decide who's going to talk first. I, I, I've done panel stuff before, so you have to kind of direct the action. There's a format to it, you know, kind of. 
Uh, I'll start unless anybody else wants to jump in front of me. Uh Um, I was born and raised in Spokane. So I'm actually from the east side of the state, which is really nice teaching on the west side. And when I come together with union folks, because I get to bring both perspectives of being born and raised on the east side and then now having been an educator on the west side of the state. I have no idea what that means, east side, west side in, in that state. Uh, thank you, Midron, again. Educating small children with this nonsense is why there are increasing numbers of children with depression and anxiety. We teach them to hate themselves with this brainwashing. I mean, that's that's my fear here when they're talking about resistance and abolition, at least in the title of the thing, because I've, I've looked at a lot of educational stuff over the years. And uh, instilling in small children that they need to assess themselves and others on the basis of things that are not determinative factors to one's character and to assume the worst of themselves or assume the weakness of others. Uh, Yeah, I, I am not looking forward to whatever the end results are of these kind of programs uh, 10, 15 years from now, as kids have to work through this stuff in environments that are teaching them, in my opinion, very regressive and very divisive ideas about themselves and society. So, but that's why we're here. I want to sort of, you know, know what's going on and, or have an idea of what's being taught, even though I don't have children of my own, it's still something that, uh, concerns me. Thank you again, Midrin. Um, for me, I all of my K-12 experience was a predominantly white experience. I, I was the only black uh, friend in like my circle of friend groups. Like I was the only black person, uh, at least in my close group. I didn't have my first educator of color or black educator until I was a sophomore in college. And skin color is very important to you then? What, what I, I, I wonder... Uh, I wonder what that meant to her. Like, what 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 does that do? What does that change? Is is it going to be one of those situations where I didn't think I could be a teacher until I until I saw someone who had my same skin color? That kind of sort of visual role model. I hear that a lot. You know, um, people need to see themselves in their role models and stuff like that. And to a certain extent, I suppose that's true. I, I get a little twitchy when it comes down to something as cursory as skin color. So I had never experienced having a teacher of color. Again, and I don't know if she'll say, what, what is the difference? What does that do? How does that change the content of their uh, education or, or the, the ability of the individual? What does that mean? Throughout that time. And although I had really wonderful, strong advocates for my education that were really supportive, they didn't look like me. They didn't have similar characteristics to my culture. And I always felt just left out, like not the same. So you had people who were supporting you, advocating for you, encouraging you, but they were lesser because they didn't look like you or quote, share your culture. Uh, okay, so they helped you regardless of what you looked like as compared to them, but as compared to you, they didn't rate as much, what weren't as meaningful. Oh, boy. Uh, thank you, uh, Chaos X, so much for the pear and the cup of blood. <laughs> blood? I mean, I'm sure it's coffee or juice or something, but... That's where my mind was at because I'm a morbid, morbid person. Thank you so much. And I always felt kind of out of place and almost like the elephant in the room for a lack of a better term. Well, if you felt that way, your feelings are your responsibility. And so I really got into elementary education, one, because they're cute. Okay, I'm not sure if that's funny or creepy. It's a little bit of both, but whatever. And two, because I really feel that I had my funnest years in elementary school and those teachers really fought hard for me. Even though they were white? So, I mean, you opened the door. I feel like I'm on an episode of Law and Order. If they open the door to something, I can't help but continue walking through it. To make sure that I went on and felt 
empowered and loved. And I really wanted to do that for students. And I also wanted to be an educator of color for my students. So I really thought if they get that at elementary school, that's great. Then they don't have to wait like I did until they were in college and was like, what? There's brown teachers out there? Y'all exist? I just thought, I don't know where y'all were. I thought maybe you were gone. So Okay. Thank you, Ebony Williams, so much. Keep it up with the exercising pair. Boy, cup, cups of blood and exercise. It's a full Sunday, guys. Thank you, Ebony, so much. For me, I really just wanted to be who I needed when I was in elementary school. No, 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 no. Okay. Let's let's make a let's make a, a distinction here. You're not talking about who here. You're talking about what. Um, you didn't say anything about the teacher. Your, your first teacher of color, you didn't say anything about the quality of the education. You didn't say anything about that person's personality. You didn't say anything at all. All that was important was the look. We're not talking about who. You're talking about what. And what does not define anything other than surface area. Uh, so I, I know I'm getting irritated by this, but I, I, I get, I get kind of irritated with identity politics a lot lately. Um, whittling people down to their component parts and trying to uh, homogenize everything into one big category instead of looking at individual people and individual merits. Um, so I, I don't know. It's just one of those things. Uh, thank you, Dark Resurrect, for the how's it going, Dog Cat Fox? Yay, Dog Cat Fox. Thank you, Dark, Dark R, Dark R. Thank Some, you, Finovia. I think uh, a lot of us who come into education feel that way. I was born in Mexico and came to the United States when I was very young. So I grew up in the United States, but um, I only lived with my mother who spoke Spanish. And so going into the school system, I only spoke Spanish. Mm -hmm. And luckily, I did live in California where um, there were Latino teachers and they spoke Spanish, but it was an, an official a dual language program. And so they were able to help me. And I remember there was one specific first grade teacher that read with me before school and the way that he made learning was so engaging and fun. And the way he made me feel of believing in myself. And I think that's really why I became a teacher to help students remember that they have a lot of light inside of them and they can shine, shine very, very bright. Okay. Now that's one thing that I, I won't, you know, oppose or jump on or anything. I mean, if you have uh, students who, uh, you know, where English is their second language, having a teacher who is either culturally or at least linguistically cha uh, trained um, in being able to help kids along to acclimate uh, that's a cultural thing. I, I don't have any problem with it at all. You know, that's just, and that's also just sort of very, very pragmatic about things too. So I'm glad that she had teachers who could, you know, uh, speak both languages and help her along. And I don't have anything against teachers who help kids at all. It doesn't matter what they look like, you know, if their abilities and their merits help the kids along, great. Um, if, if a kid finds value in seeing a role model of theirs, uh, who they can relate to in some way, shape, or form. I don't necessarily have anything against that either, even if one of the factors is uh, they, they look like them. That, that, that you know, isn't, isn't a big deal to me. But when you whittle it down to just that, it's just that, you know. That's when I get a little... I mean, are you going to tell us anything about the person and not just about what they look like, not just about something that has nothing to do with them and their their experience or their merit or anything else, but you you only care about the surface level stuff. So anyway, um, yeah, thank you too for sharing. I feel like I saw some mirrors and then also some windows too. <laughs> I saw some mirrors and also some windows. Okay. Um. I was born on the big island of Hawaii, of Hawaii, mm -hmm. um, and that's where I attended kindergarten. Okay. And then um, my parents uprooted us and moved us to the mainland because there's just more opportunities in education mm -hmm. um, because they just couldn't afford for us to go to private school, which were kind of the only like really 
rigorous schools in on the big island. And yeah. so uh, when I came to the mainland, I spent a couple of years in California. I loved California. I was so happy. I saw so many people that like looked like me and like had beautiful tan skin like me. <sighs> uh huh. Tell me more about your skin color preferences. And then we shot up to Washington. <laughs> uh -huh. And then all of those beautiful tan skins like you disappeared. So how are you faring in a land that I have to assume is far more pale than you prefer? And all of a sudden I did it. Uh <laughs> <laughs> well, how did you cope? Oh my gosh, how did you cope with having people who are not of the appropriate skin color around you? I, I'm very curious to know, how, how do you deal with uh, your students who aren't of the preferred tone? Again, you're opening the door and I, I'm just walking through. Um, and so I started third grade in um, Covington, Washington. Um, and I had amazing teachers, um, but you know, race was race and culture was never talked about. Like I, uh, so even at third grade, you were really focused on race and culture. Okay. I remember like one diversity poster up on my fourth grade teacher's wall. That was like an acronym and that was it. And it was up there and we never talked about it. Yeah. It's almost like making it irrelevant is a bad thing or something. Is, is that what I'm to understand? Um, at least from what I can remember. And so I got teased a lot. I got I got teased for my skin color. Anytime I told them my Hawaiian name, um, they would mispronounce it. They would say, you should just go by Camille. Camille's prettier anyways. Um, and I used to get um, teased for any kind of stereotype about Hawaii and Hawaiian culture. And so... And no other kid has ever been teased about anything about them before or otherwise. Um, there was a, there was a Polish kid in my elementary school and he had, and to this day, if I tried, I couldn't pronounce his last name otherwise, you know, just because, you know, but he got teased for his last name. He was white. He was teased by other white kids. P people get teased for things about them all the time when they're kids because you're kids and you don't have the... Okay, so you were made fun of because you were different, and no one's ever been made fun of because they're different before except for you, I guess. You're not special. I hate to tell you this. You are not special in that regard. You really aren't. At a really early age, I learned to push away my culture and push away that part of me. Like, I remember avoiding the sun so that I couldn't, so that I would stay paler. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, I remember like foregoing my middle name at all, not telling people I was from Hawaii or. Those all sound like personal choices you made. You're giving in to peer pressure or your own sense of social anxiety or whatever else. You know, I have sympathy in regards to social anxiety. I have sympathy for trying to fit in. I was made fun of because I was small and I had glasses and. I was quiet and shy and everything else. I got beat up and picked on and all, all and on. And you know, just aside from how I was as a person and how I behaved, I don't know if there's anything else much to make fun of, except I was, you know, I was just that kid. But you know what? You pick up, you move on. And eventually I learned it really doesn't matter what they're going to say. I'm going to be who I am. Regardless, I'm not going to try to conform. I mean, why would I want to conform to the attitudes or desires of people who make me feel bad? That that was kind of where I arrived at. I think it, I think it took me till seventh grade or so to just to make a decision like I don't care anymore, or I don't care as much. So, uh, well, I hope you reach that point in your own life. Maybe you'll tell us. We're telling it in kind of a small way. Um, and that carried on into like high school and middle school. And it, and I had like really amazing teachers. Uh, and I hope some of them are watching because some of them are still WEA members. <laughs> um, uh -huh. They just didn't have the resources necessary, I feel like, to have these conversations. And I did have all white educators in elementary school. And so they also didn't have the lived experiences to really help me through this. And yeah, white teachers don't have any lived experiences that might align with your own because obviously they can't because they're a different skin color. 
I'm sure none of your teachers had any experience in the past with being teased by kids or made fun of or belittled for things they had no control over and so on and so on because they're white and obviously they never have those problems. Certainly. Okay. Good to know. Uh, thank you again, Midran. Very generous of you. Uh, it fascinates me that the logical conclusion of the argument is for education to be based on sex and race separation. Bring back segregation and apply it to, the, to society to achieve equality. Uh, Midran, have you ever heard of the phrase affinity groups, yeah, specifically in education? If you have not, I hope you never do. Uh, but affinity groups is something that I've just recently learned is something that some schools are applying to their curriculums. Uh, I have a video on it. You can uh, uh, find it uh, in my playlist. Not a play. Well, it's on the it's on the curriculum of fear playlist uh, as uh, color coded. It's the most recent one, and uh, it's disturbing. Very disturbing. The people are smiling about this concept, but you're not far off the mark at all. In fact, you're you're pretty much right on it. And so. Going into education, that is what I wanted to bring were those resources and that power and that just that care for students. You mean that care for students so long as they're the right color? Because you've been very focused on color this whole time. Um, so that they can open up and never. And I tell my I tell my students the story sometimes of my time on the mainland in uh, Covington, Washington, um, in elementary school. And because I want them to feel okay to share those experiences so we can dismantle those horrible, awful experiences and really empower them to have, to never have to go through that again and never have to feel the way I did. Every kid should go through that. Every person should go through a trial by fire. This is how you find out who you are. This is how you find out how to relate to other people and decide what kind of person you're going to be. Facing adversity, unfair, unjust when you're a kid. When kids don't have the filters, it's part of growing up. I, I, I don't favor bullying, but it's inevitable. I don't favor kids feeling bad about themselves or being uncertain about who they are and so on and so forth, but it's inevitable. It's going to happen. You cannot protect or shelter kids from the trials of life. I'm not talking about the part where like the, you know, the orca whale eats the dolphin or whatever. Uh, I, 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 can, I can at least peripherally or by extension understand the, the desire to protect children, you know. I mean, that sort of parental thing. You don't want kids to be hurt. You don't want them to cry. You don't want them to be harmed. You want to protect them. You know, I, I watched Satsu with his daughter. I, I talked to Monkey about his kids and raising them and everything else. And I've, I've had my experiences uh, sort of feeling that, uh, I, I don't know what you want to call it, that paternal instinct uh, in the past with, uh, uh, with a, a previous girlfriend of mine and her, her kids. Uh, but at the same time, I also know that it's because of the things I had to go through, the, the, the challenges, the, the yuck, that I found who I was by overcoming it. I, I don't know if I'd be the same person I am today if I'd been insulated from all of it. You know? I mean, some things you just have to figure out for yourself. That's how you find out who you are. And I know I'm going a bit off on this, and she only made one comment, but it's it's that kind of thinking that kind of, uh, I, I don't know. You, you, you want to protect kids from the worst of the world, but unfortunately, the kids need to experience the world in all its good and bad parts sometimes. So they, you know, grow up. On the mainland. Thank you all. Um, so, you know, I'm noticing that all of you are saying that your elementary experiences um, were not what we would envision for our own students today. And they... they well, as far as envision is concerned, it all sounds very skin color based. So tell me about your more perfect process. That you didn't have educators of color, or at least did not have uh, many educators of color, uh -huh. and that um, you basically did not feel like you had a home in your elementary schools, which is what I know you all try to make for your students in your classrooms. And I get at that age and everything else, schools are meant to feel, you know, homey and comfortable and, and so on. But 
it's still school, you know, and, 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 I, and I get elementary schools kind of the gradual transition in education from a home environment to a more regimented school environment. I get that. That also, in my mind, creates an area of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, vulnerability in trying to separate what is and is not meant to be raising kids versus educating kids. Now I've got the sirens going on in the background. Sorry, guys, live TV. I, I can't tell how loud that is for you as compared to me, so I don't want to... Okay, get bled out by it. Anyway, uh, I lost my train of thought, something about home to school life, but I think you got where I was going. Um, part of this, I think, comes from our teacher ed programs, right? Um, I personally went to Western Washington University, and I think Emma did too. Is that right? Yep. So I'm not going to talk too much about Western because I know Emma's probably has stuff to say. Okay. Um, but I just want to ask you all, uh, you know, to speak on your teacher ed programs and to speak honestly and truthfully, some of us had real good experiences and some of us had really, really, really challenging experiences. Okay. Um, and I guess just uh, let us know how those experiences led you to being the teacher you are today or how the, how it impacted you. Okay. So we've gone from their personal childhood education experiences <clears throat> And now we're going on to the actual education they received in becoming teachers. Is that is that what I'm understanding, I think? Okay. I can go ahead and talk about, um, so I went to Western Washington University um, in Bellingham, Woodring College of Education. Um, and it's known to be, produce a lot of teachers. And An educational school produced a lot of teachers, you say? Okay. I just want to say I am thankful for the mentors that I did find there mm -hmm. because um, it's not what it what they write down in their mission and their statements and but my mentors really helped me find um, the strength to keep going and to find the resources and to um, I think community is also what I found at Western. Um, uh, Midran says, scribe like teacher ed programs don't teach you the most important thing, classroom management. I think, I mean, just like with many things you learn in college, there's, there's the sort of the academic knowledge and then there's the practical knowledge on the ground, which you can't really learn until you do it kind of thing. And, uh, uh, my, my mother worked in education. My father did peripherally as well. I've known people who've worked in education. So I have the highest respect for teachers and just the amount of work they have to go through for relatively little pay a lot of the times and a lot of restrictions and a lot of other things. I don't know what the, you know, current, I guess, atmosphere of things is because I haven't talked to the people that I know in education, you know, lives drift off, but in the past I have. And so I can only imagine what a well-meaning teacher has to go through these days with all of what I see on the, uh, on the news and such. So I have a I, just as a clarity clarification, I have a high respect for educators in general, uh, both those that I've had in my life and people that I've known otherwise, and just as a respect for the profession. Where I start getting worried, of course, is when you start injecting an agenda into it, an ideology. You're looking at yourself not so much as an educator, but as a, uh, a trainer of activists, that kind of thing. That's where it starts uh, diverting from my uh, from my uh, support, let's say. Uh, thank you, Chicago Mike. Speak honestly and truthful as opposed to lies and fictional. That was, a, that was a very odd odd turn of phrase for her, wasn't it? It's like, I hope you hope speak honestly and truthful. Like, do you expect that they won't? I think I was going to say something on that before the siren started, but either way. Regardless of the program or not, but the program itself was very white and... Oh. What does that mean? What, what does that mean? The program was very white. I, I, she, I she's not. I, I, I'm sure she won't define what she means by that. But just lay it out there. Uh, what does that mean? What does it mean? It was very white. And I felt like the equity that was said to have had happened wasn't happening. And what does that mean? 
what equity? Okay. And again, I'm going off of the new speak. Equity equates to equity equates. Equity is the same as saying equality of outcome, not equality of opportunity, equality of outcome. That's what equity means in most contexts these days. Now, maybe I'm wrong in her case, but then she's not telling us what she means. The, it was a very white program. The equity was not happening. What do you mean? It's always the people of color um, running initiatives to get committees going. And then it felt like when we were in committees, we were just having meetings about things, but the lack, there was definitely lack of action. What? Okay. All right, let me break that down again. So it was only people of color who were initiating committees. And when the committees got together, nothing was happening. Uh, did, I, did I get that? But I would say I'm most thankful for, for the mentors. <laughs> what? What? Okay, so you had a great experience. You're thankful for your mentors, but it was too white. There wasn't the equity you, you wanted and committees weren't doing anything. Uh, okay, I, this, this, is, this is your presentation. But call out your mentors. Who are your mentors, Emma? <laughs> Veronica Velez, Kristen French. Um, I'm like spazzing out, but there's just so many more. Um, uh -huh. Specifically women of color. Um, <sighs> specifically women of color. Okay. So if, if, if they weren't female and they weren't of color, then they're not worth consideration. Is that? Okay. Annalise. Um, Jessica Stone. Those You're are making her nervous. I know. I'm like, I have to remember the list. I just know that there's a huge community of powerful women of color that are still um, there and trying to form community. And I still am in contact with every single one of them. And I think that's um, that's why education is still alive for us. Um, radical teachers because we have built communities with radical teachers was she just saying that or is that like an actual term used i don't know people we trust and can keep us going even if we're not talking to each other all the time we know we got each other's back okay now, real quick i just want to piggyback on what you're saying emma because um Beto was such a major part um in helping me transform into the educator I want to be. And Kristen was, I, I mean, I know you know Kristen is like everybody's mother. And there were so many times where, you know, she would Im invite us over, she would make us fry bread, she would just have us all in her house. And it was just like this beautiful, uh, loving experience. I, I really wish I could say to these teachers, could you stay on task? Like talk about what you're here to talk about. I mean, I understand there's sort of an unavoidable social commiseration aspect to this kind of stuff, but I'm actually here to learn something or to find out what the subject of the talk actually is. And I'm feeling like maybe I should have cut off more than just the first eight minutes. I thought they were actually starting the conversation, but okay. Um, and that is exactly why I think I am the educator I am today is because of the educators who um, supported me and uplifted me and mentored me in times that um, you know, I thought I wasn't going to continue on this path. So, I uh, does it matter what the color of those mentors were? Because everybody else seems to think so. Anytime I can call out and shout out my mentors, Veto and Kristen, I just want to do it because, you know, love them so much. Got to give them my gratitude. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll go ahead. I went to Whitworth in Spokane which is a predominantly, like, it's a very small university. It's a private Presbyterian university. Mm -hmm. um, I was fortunate enough in high school to receive the Act 6 Leadership Scholarship. So I was really excited as a high school senior to get my school paid for. I was super into it. No. But I was not excited about staying in town and going, like, 20 minutes down the road because everybody else was leaving and they were going to try stuff. And so I was really worried about staying in the place where I did not feel welcomed or like I belonged. And so Wait, you got a, you got a full scholarship to a, it sounds like a private school, but, 
and it was 20 minutes away from home and you didn't uh, what if, if if i got a full ride scholarship to some really fancy school and it was 20 minutes from my house i'd be jumping for joy but that's you felt like you didn't belong because yeah okay so that already set me up for just like a battle of i don't see myself in this place ever and i never have you got a free holy cats tall person wow thank you so much uh hoy all i will watch in full later belated happy charity day well thank you tall person that's amazing thank you so much that's oh you spoil me i Everybody here's been so generous today. Uh, I'll be I'll be paying it forward. Uh, I, I promise that. Uh, and you, you guys you guys know uh, that I do. So I will I will do that after the show. Thank you, thank you so much, tall person. That's that's ridiculously generous of you. Appreciate it. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, uh, given a full scholarship to for a, a quality education, but that's not good enough because she didn't feel like she belonged, and it was only twenty minutes away from her house. And I, I guess I guess I can get like wanting to break out of your routine when you were a kid and and go and do other things in other places, but I, I guess maybe just the practical pragmatic part of me just says, hey grit your teeth for a couple of years and get a good education and then you can move on somewhere else. That's just kind of how, especially if it's being paid for. Sorry. And now I'm here. And for me, um, I struggled really, really bad academically in college. And why you got a scholarship, didn't you? Weren't I'm, Okay, I mean, things can happen when you're growing up. I, I don't know. I never really felt that my, I guess you would say my gen ed teachers or instructors in college were really supportive of me and kind of just saw me as like that uh, diversity quota is not doing so hot. She doesn't know her stuff. Wait, are you saying that you were there as a result of a diversity quota or that you are projecting that notion onto your team. I mean, you're obviously projecting that notion onto your teachers, but did you get that scholarship only because of what you are and not of what you've done? Okay, now I'm really intrigued. And so I didn't really get a lot of support from those instructors, but it was actually the advisor for the Act 6 scholarship program that was on my campus, Esther Louie. She had been running that program for the 10 years that had been at Whitworth and within Washington State. And she was just a diehard, radical, one of those badass grassroots educators that, you know, she really fought for students. She fought for the people and she was down with Brown and everyone else. And like, oh, Jesus. <sighs> You know, on any, under any other circumstances, replace replace all this racial talk with people praising white skin or something, or or saying, "Boy, I wish I had some white teachers." Or, "Are you uh, um, are you working with white or something?" I I don't know. You know how cringy this stuff is and creepy it is. Same mentality. Same. Ugh. Like fought for the power. And I really, really needed her mentorship when I was there. And she was just great. She had those come to Jesus moments with me to say, like, Zenobia, girl, you have to kind of, like, go to class and do some stuff. And I was like. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you, you needed. OK, so this was college, right? Am I am I misremembering this? This was a scholarship to a college, a Presbyterian school or something, some private school. You needed a counselor at school to tell you to go to class and do your work. It, it, none of that occurred to you prior to that point? What? Like, what? Yeah, I'm right there with you. What? Yes. You guys didn't say that in the orientation. Like, she, like, really had those moments with me. 
and also was there with me when I was like, I can't do this. I don't belong here. I don't think I should be in college. Like I should just be done. And she was like, there's no reason for you to ever say that. And you deserve this spot. And sounds like you had a lot of personal problems going on in your head, a lot of personal I don't know, self-confidence issues. And of course you are assessing yourself in terms of appearances amongst everybody else. I mean, in a sense, I'm glad your counselor or your uh, uh, mentor or whatever tried to push you past all of that because those aren't positive things to be proceeding through life with. But at the same time, it's kind of surprising, all things considered you know, reminded me of what got me there. But I, I'm, I'm curious to know, and I don't know anything about the scholarship program she mentioned. I, I'm curious to know what are the prerequisites to qualify for that scholarship? If she ended up in college in a, in a very, it sounds like, you know, private and or expensive college, and she didn't have the, I, I don't know, the personal initiative to just attend class and do the work, what was the scholarship for? It's crazy when I think about it. She was not an instructor for me. She was my advisor of the scholarship I received. She was not a professor for me. She was not in the school of ed for me. She was an outside person that gave me that. And when I think back on that, I feel really sad that I didn't have people in my school of ed who supported me in that way. And uh you mean supported you even though you weren't doing the work or coming to class? What, what do you expect? What, what, what do you expect of teachers in that level of things? I mean, I can understand, and I experienced this myself. You know, when you're, a, when you're in elementary school and you're still learning, you know, how to socialize and such, it's not that difficult, and I think it's very common, to look upon a teacher as sort of a secondary parental figure after a fashion. Because what, what's your experience with adults at that age? It's pretty much your parents or, you know, the, the parents of your friends and that kind of thing. So seeing a teacher as a secondary parental figure is, I think, natural. I don't, I don't see a problem with that at all. Once you start getting into your teens, late teens, and especially into college, what are you anticipating these professors are supposed to do for you? They are educators. They are not your parents. They're not your best friends. They're not your counselors. Maybe you establish a relationship with a teacher or two beyond simply teacher, student, professor, uh, student, etc. But for the most part, they're not there to raise you at that point. They're not there to take a particular interest in you and look after you and care about all your feelings and so on. I mean, what, I, I'm really curious, and I know I'm not going to get an answer. I'm really curious to know exactly what our speaker's expectation at that point in her life was for educators. Uh, not elementary school. I'm talking about adult world, college level. I'm an adult now, and I need to take care of myself. What does she anticipate a college professor is supposed to do in regards to individual students and their quote-unquote needs outside of education. That's my curiosity. In that real loving way. Don't loving what? Okay. Again, obviously our speaker and I have very, very, very different Im images of what the relationship between a college professor, college level educator, and a student should be, or, or should be uh, anticipated to be, at least by the student. Don't get me wrong. I had some bomb ass school of ed professors that like really showed me really great skills to be a teacher. And that wasn't enough. Educators teaching you to be an educator. There, there's a but coming, isn't there? Or however. That wasn't enough. So, so what were they not doing that you needed besides in a school of education? But we never talked about race. We never talked about diversity. We never talked about social justice in the classroom. Yeah, I wonder why, because maybe it's not relevant. Maybe the focus should be on education and academics and not on social ideology or divvying people up on the basis of their skin color. M maybe, maybe they're not there to do that. We only talked about classroom management. 
you talked about classroom management. Really? Well, I, Midran, I guess, I guess some people do do that. <laughs> we only talked about teaching to the standards. Uh huh. So in a, in a school of education, they talked about how to be an educator. Yeah. What? Holy cats. How dare they? And making strong units and lesson plans. And, you know, I felt prepared in that sense when I walked in the classroom. But... But I didn't feel prepared to address the homelessness that was in my classroom. What? The abuse that was happening with my students. I... What? And the oppression that was happening between me and the white supremacy uh, curriculum and culture that was happening in my classroom and what it was doing to my students at the same time. The white supremacy curriculum in your classroom. The abuse, the homelessness. I... Okay. And again, I want to make allowances for the fact that teachers often wear a lot of hats, not just those that they actually are certified for. As counselors, sometimes as quasi-social workers, or at least, you know, go-betweens between uh, administration and parents and students and so on. And, and things can happen that a teacher has to get involved in simply because they're a witness to the quality of life of a child. I, I get that. You were at a school of education. You were being trained to be a teacher, how to handle a classroom, how to create a lesson plan, how to teach. They were there to teach you how to teach. And you wanted social work education? Well, you can get that on the side, I guess. But homelessness, abuse, the white supremacist curriculum? That's what you went into school that's the attitude you had going into being a teacher. <sighs> okay. I never got any, any instruction on any of that. And that really, really sucked to start school and not have been prepared for the real parts of teaching. The real parts of teaching. Not classroom management, not lesson plans, not setting uh, uh, assignments. The re Homelessness, abuse, white supremacist education, and race. Those are the real parts of teaching to our speaker. Okay. I, I have a sneaking suspicion I'm going to go past the hour and a half mark, guys, just as a warning. And those of you in the future that can see the timestamp, you'll know whether or not I'm accurate on that. But to be prepared for, you know, what teaching looks like on paper and what it looks like on a box. So I'm very thankful for the mentors I had at Whitworth and the people that kept me going. But I really did not feel a part of that campus at all. And I really stuck to my Act 6 family and the cadre members I had with Act 6. I still talk to those people to this day. We are still doing our thing over. So you separated yourself out socially from other people, I'm assuming on the basis of race, because that's all you're talking about. You formed a clique with the other people who were there on the basis of the scholarship that you received for whatever reason. I. You you classified it as a diversity quota thing. I don't know if that's actually true or not, but that's how you put it. Uh, so you willfully separated yourself out from other people, assessed teachers on the basis of whether or not they were teaching things you thought were relevant to education, not so much because they were relevant to you, obviously. You're the one focused on race. You're the one focused on white supremacy and so on. You're not projecting at all, and you didn't decide to exclude yourself from other people. It was all done to you, I guess. All right. Thank you again, Midrin. So, that, you're very, very generous today. Thank you so much. Sweetie, you are there to teach your content, not be a sub substitute parent, not be their friend, to teach them how to learn. Yeah. Teach them how to think, not what to think.
And, and again, I, in the elementary school of things, I can understand, I really can, I'm not being facetious here. I can understand a, especially when you're working with uh, young children, a, a, a sort of parental instinct that a lot of us have just overall, just that, that, like that, that lizard brain take care of and, and protect the children thing. And sometimes that can bleed over a little bit from what should be a professional, quasi-professional relationship into something more of a quasi-parental relationship. Okay, in elementary school, I can see that happening. You know, it takes it takes a professional to be able to draw the line between those things, right? You know, you don't wanna be some kind of cold-hearted machine. At the same time though, you don't wanna start blurring the lines between what your role is versus what the parent's role is. And I, I can only imagine, because I've never been there, I can only imagine what trying to maintain that balance can look like. I'm sure it's not easy at times. So I get that. But, you know, like Midran says, you have to keep in mind, you are not the parent. You are not the guide for their life or their thinking or their belief system. You're there to educate. You're there to teach them about the basics and teach them how to think through things not what to think about things so much. That's the ideal. Now, just like objectivity in journalism, it's an impossible goal, but it should always be strived for, right? So, yeah, this this lady's this lady's disturbing me a little bit. Well, more than a little bit, but you know, everything in proportion. We're in White Center, we're up in Tacoma, we're over in Spokane. Like there's a huge alumni network that have continued to fight and push for students like us in secondary education and post-secondary. So I'm thankful that I had actual peers who were my mentors when I was at my uh, prep program. Actual peers. What, what, I mean, I, I think I already know the answer, but I'll just ask the question rhetorically. <sighs> what qualifies as peerage in our speaker's world, I wonder? Well, like I said, I don't I don't think I have to wonder that far, but all the same. Yeah, I I feel that the peers. Um, I did my bachelor's over at the University of Connecticut because I got a scholarship and I just wanted to get out of there. I was so done. Um, I came back though because my my family really needed me to, and I just felt like I needed to be back over on the West Coast. Um, well, West Coast is the best coast. I might be biased. And I uh, did my master's at UW with the Seattle Teacher Residency, which um, I loved my time in it, and it was because of my cohort. Like we just got really close. Um, we did affinity groups in one of the courses we did, which. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. okay, there you go. Affinity groups. Tell me about affinity groups. Was the best. Affinity groups were the best. Now, admittedly, that phrase can mean, I guess, several different things depending on what you're talking about. Because uh, the video I did, they talked about affinity groups being, could be a multitude of things. I mean, they were specifically talking about race and or gender, but more specifically race. Uh, it could be something else. So, okay, given, given the amorphous nature of the phrase, maybe she'll tell us what she means by affinity groups. Um, and I just like, I owe so much to my fellow black indigenous, like teachers of color. Your fellow black indigenous teachers of color. Fellow. Okay. In that affinity group, like one is still okay. So we are talking affinity groups segregated by race. Okay, I'm gonna back up a little bit because I, I cut her off. Really close. Um, we did affinity groups in one of the courses we did, which was the best. Um, and I just like I owe so much to my fellow Black Indigenous like teachers of color in that affinity group. Like one is still my best friend, like Jasmine Nguyen, amazing educator at Highland Park Elementary. And she has just gotten me through so much. And that cohort, especially. Um, cohort, What? why not just like social group? What cohort? It sounds so clinical whenever I hear that cohort. So it's, it's like a, a term I'll hear in like statistical analysis or, or things like that, studies and such. I, I don't know. It's. Maybe just sort of a, 
uh, vocabulary pet peeve of mine. The like the BIPOC educators oh. at the affinity group we did was yeah. really what helped me unlearn all the white supremacy that I that was kind of like shoved into me. So you unlearned the white supremacy that was shoved into you by splitting people off on the basis of race. <sighs> Thank you, Ebony Williams, for the, uh, the, the horn-blowing lemon and the smaller, again, I, I want to say lime. I'm sure it's a pear, but all the same. And the horn-blowing pear, the marching band of citrus. Thank you, Ebony. And thank you, Chicago Mike. Is it me or is her voice annoying? I I, I don't know. It, it tones of voice and things just kind of wash over me at this point. I'm I'm more focused on the words than necessarily the intonation. So, uh, sure, if it is to you, okay. But yeah, okay. So uh, you had to unlearn the white supremacy by segregating people on the basis of race and saying it's wonderful to do so. <sighs> during my own like well third grade to 12th grade education and i was really struggling with my identity because you were really struggling with your identity got it um you know like i had spent so long shoving it down to be able to code switch and to be able to be accepted you know and to be able to look like my brother who is white presenting um, your brother who is white presenting. <sighs> okay, so as, as you were growing up, you were struggling to fit in with other kids. Oh my gosh, that never happens to anybody but you. <sighs> Holy cow, thank you, Midran Emrys. I really, <laughs> got, and guys, like I say, uh, generosity today is just amazing. Uh, I'll be... Like I say, I'll be paying it forward. Uh, major issue with current education. It is using unsupported ideas from psychology slash sociology that is about a decade old and shoehorning it into areas it wasn't meant to apply to, including since discredited theories. Uh, I, I believe it. I mean, just on the basis of the whole affinity group thing, you want to talk about a discredited theory, racial segregation in the classroom. I, I don't know what else to tell you. I don't know what I don't know what more needs to be said. I, I I am I am honestly bewildered as to how that concept. It, I mean, anywhere in particular, but in, in education specifically, sounds like a good idea. I really don't get it. And as far as like bad ideas being rehashed into something that's new and supposedly good, I can believe that too. Uh, because if schools are willing to sit upon fringe stuff that's already been shown to be not productive, but now raise it up as like the new virtuous uh, uh, pathway to education or something, I can believe it. I mean, all we're seeing now is just a, a rebranding of some very old, very tired, and very ultimately, I think, destructive ideas and ideologies. And she's talking about it right now. Affinity groups assessing people on the basis of their skin. Her own brother is somehow, I don't know what, inherently flawed because he doesn't have the same skin tone she does. Where are we going with this? Um, and amazing too, <laughs> you know, and so they were really there for me in that affinity group space to really unlearn that and empower me and empower me to take back charge of my identity of my native Hawaiian identity and heritage. So you're you're thankful for an echo chamber in which racial identity was prominent and important. Okay. Now, I just want to differentiate here. It, I don't have any problem, I mean, you know, in, the, in the, the grand scale of things, of people setting aside the criticisms of others and doing what you feel is right for you. She was teased as a kid because she had a different name, because she looked different, and so on. And so she chose to try to fit in to deny those things and try to go along to get along, which, again, that's nothing new. 
And it doesn't necessarily require you to be looking different or be from a different ethnicity for that stuff to happen. That just happens to kids. But okay, that happened to her. And so she attempted for a while to fit in. And then eventually she decided, I don't want to have to deny what's part of my, you know, personality, my family and so Fine. Great. What does that have to do with being in this, this cauldron of racial focus in education? What does your reclaiming your identity have to do with teaching other kids about affinity groups or praising racial segregation? Do you want to be inclusive? Do you want to promote looking beyond these things about people and accepting people for who they are rather than what they are? Or don't you? Um, and I don't know where I would have been as an educator without them, especially Jasmine, who to this day, like we still analyze things together. I'm like, guess what so-and-so said? Like, <laughs> Well, that's great. I'm doing that right now. I analyze what people say all the time. I find it, I find it very enlightening. <laughs> like, and just, and just how to navigate the racism that we face. Yeah. Like affinity groups, that kind of racism. And prejudice and discrimination we face. Like affinity groups in education. As educators of color in the school system that we're actively trying to dismantle. And I like. You're actively trying to dismantle the school system you work in is I said, I just don't know what I would do without my peers who have lived experiences like me and then are also different than me to help me understand what how other educators of color are walking through this space. Because, you know, we have similarities, but we're also vastly different. Uh, yeah. Tell me again about affinity groups and what it takes to qualify for that. What, what is the what is the uh, the bar for entrance into one of your affinity groups exactly? Tell me that again. Uh, Sinatra says is in the chat. Hello, Sinatra. And uh, thanks again to Sinatra, whose uh, video on that TEDx talk uh, uh, led to uh, Kurt Metzger finding my channel and then me ending up on his podcast. Uh, by the way, uh, that'll be published uh, tomorrow to the YouTube channel. And as soon as it is, I'll uh, be sure to tweet that out to everybody. Uh, so you can uh, see the wonderment that it was doing live TED Excellence uh, with a professional comedian. It was uh, it was something else. Moving on. Um, okay, so there's a question I want to ask you all. It's not part of the questions that we rehearsed, or not. We didn't rehearse anything, first of all, everybody. But not I, I, I can tell that you hadn't rehearsed anything. Okay, guys, uh, I, I'm going to go beyond the hour and a half mark. Obviously, we're just we're just getting into the meat of this. So. Again, those of you watching in the future, you already know how long I went. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll, we're going to go at least two hours. If by the time I get to uh, 10 o'clock my time, it still grabbed my attention, I may continue further. Uh, for those of you that decide to sit it out with me, I appreciate it. If you decide to log off for now, come back later, maybe. Perfectly understandable. But uh, I, I am continually intrigued at this point. So let's go. Not part of the questions that we made a list of. Um, so my question is. Yes. We live in 2020. Right? The current year. Right. And right. everything around us right now feels like it's just like coming to pieces. And I fall to pieces over you. Fires all around us and mm -hmm. fires that we can't put all out or put out individually. Right? And, and, and fires allowed to happen by certain mayors of certain cities because it's a summer of love, that kind of thing. Right. So um, my question is, yes. did your teacher ed programs prepare you to be a teacher in 2020? Well, she already answered that question. She already said that her teacher ed program didn't talk about race, didn't prepare her for the homelessness and abuse and white supremacy of her classroom. So hasn't that been asked and answered? Again, I'm like leaning on a Law and Order episode or something. 
Wow, the, the silence is deafening. Also, you really should start calling on people. I, just waiting for someone to jump in. You really should just call on someone. Dang, that's a good question. <laughs> it's a question you already answered, so it should be pretty easy. I'm a, um, I need to think like two seconds on that. because. Why? You, you just answered a second ago. You told us that the teacher's ed program that you went through told you about classroom management and lesson plan construction and so on, but did not prepare you for the abuse, the homelessness, and the white supremacy curriculum of your school. You already answered this. Why, why do you need to think about it? I mean, I've got your answer ready for you. It, that's really good. Is it good or has it already been? Okay. You know, I would say that they did. I, I took a lot of particular because of my major which was language literacy and culture studies i took um ethnic study classes like african-american studies and latinx studies latinx studies is that was that the official title oh boy okay um and well, wait what, why would you uh, now our speaker here she's from mexico originally grew up in a mexican family as I understand it, why would you need to take studies on? There, there's a joke I could make here from a uh, Cheech and Chong uh, movie, but I'm not going to now. We did a lot of uh, classes for teaching to ELL students, and um, I was in a minor that was education and social justice, and that is where a lot of ah. my radical teaching prepped me. And Okay, a minor in social justice, and that's where her radical teaching came from. Okay. Even in um, early uh, elementary education, Kristen French and Annalise um, and Jessica Stone, my professors, um, I knew ahead of time which teachers I wanted to be with because I knew that they would really bring the content and really push me forward. And so, and they're slowly building an empire in. Uh, within Woodring, but I feel like because I knew which classes to take and had talked to other people in connection with like other people of color that were um, not necessarily in my cohort, but in general. Um, and that was your, that was your filtering requirement? You know, who you'd accept into your circle? Keep talking. I mean, you, yeah, just please keep talking. Tell me more. Yeah, uh, I think it overall, I am not a reflection of Woodring and I feel like Woodring would very much claim that often of like, oh, can we, so, so and so is coming. Um, can you sit in this meeting and talk about all the work that you're doing? Um, and that would basically be claimed by Woodring, but. Um, Wait, so the college you're at, you believe would just look at you as what, what window dressing? Is, did, did I? And I, honestly, I I don't know. Did, am I am I hearing that right? That's how she sees her college, and how her she sees her college seeing her. The work that I am doing in the classroom is does come from my studies of woodring, but then it also comes from other parts. And I'd say um, they tried. The, okay, so. Maybe maybe I misunderstood. You you you'd say that the college would take credit for how you conduct your classroom, but they tried, but it wasn't good enough. I got some mixed messages there. I mean, what was her education useful or wasn't it? It's, it sounds like she's saying it wasn't, or not completely. Okay. Uh huh. Say something. Uh, I feel this. I feel similarly. I would say like, yes, in a way, but I don't think in the way they meant to, if that makes any sense. It makes absolutely no sense. Could you clarify, please? I think um, they provided me a residency in Seattle where I was like in the classroom four out of five days a week for uh -huh. the whole year. Like okay. I saw from jumpstart all the way to kindergarten graduation and the last day of school, okay. which I think provided me with like 
real experience to uh -huh. learn from a really great uh, like social justice oriented educator who now teaches in Renton. She's really amazing. A social justice educator, you know, uh, that's always and already worrying to me because if you have to predicate educator with a particular social ideology, I mean, what what, what if it was uh, uh, a conservative educator, a Republican educator, a uh, neoconservative educator? You know, in in a public school, in an elementary school, would that sound would that sound permissible to our speaker? I wonder. Would she not worry or have any concerns about an educator whose first and foremost priority is something other than just academics and education? I'd be curious. Uh, thank you, Zan Wild. Daughter and grandbaby just came over. See you later. Bye, Zan. Have fun with the daughter and grandbaby. Uh. And uh, congratulations, I assume, to the relatively recent birth of said grandbaby, if they are still a baby. <laughs> uh, all right. So, um, uh, yeah, tell me more. Um, and it allowed me a chance to be close to teachers of color to learn. <sighs> but I think that wasn't super purposeful on their part. Like they didn't go in and be like, okay, Caitlin Kamala is going to leave with this, this, and this, <laughs> you know, I took the initiative to make it into that experience and seek the experience that I wanted to. Oh, you took the initiative as a teacher, as a grown adult to do your, your job and use your education. Oh, well, now it's, it's great. Uh, tell me more about how the importance of people's skin color is to your, your methodology better myself uh -huh. for my students. Right. Um, and so I actually now mentor for STR2. And I was really against it because I was like, I don't want to open up my classroom. What do I have to open up? Um, and then my friend kind of convinced me because my the student teacher I had this last year needed an emergency placement switch. I, I don't know what STR2 is. I don't have a point of reference for what she's talking about. So I, I'm not quite sure how to how to see that. Um, and it was just so beautiful. She is an educator of color as well. She's also a Why am I not surprised? API. And it was so amazing to try to give her the experience, the full experience I wanted and fought so hard for. So like mentoring her in that affinity of both being educators of color, because my mentor teacher was not an educator of color, still an amazing, beautiful individual. Yeah, still an amazing, beautiful individual, but just lacking, you know lacking in that really important factor might have been a good teacher might have been a great person but you know they just they just couldn't be part of the affinity group you know for reasons and it really helped me but there are just some things that she just couldn't get like because her brain was different because of her skin color she tried really hard but there are some things that i came and i was like i don't know what to do about this i think i got like you know i think someone was putting their white fragility on me. And I don't know what to do now because I'm left with this really icky feeling. And she tried, but she just couldn't. Wow. You felt icky because of their white fragility. I, I would love, love to know more about that story. I'd love to have more details as to how that all hashed out. Okay, so... Um, you are a racial separatist. All right. Tell me more. Versus when my student teacher came to me, I was able to be like, hey, I get it. That does happen in this program sometimes. And like, let me listen and tell me what you need in this situation. And I was able to mentor her in the way that I really wish I got to. Because they weren't white and you weren't white. And a white person could not have done that for you because they're white and fragile. Is that, is that what I'm getting? Okay. I love Caitlin that you kind of got to do like a full circle moment. Like you experienced, I don't love that you had to experience it, but I do love that you went through it and then you were able to mentor your student teacher in a better way that you wish you would have gotten. Like you were able to have that reflection prior to having that student teacher. I feel like mm, that's really priceless. That's really good. Yeah, no, you can't put a price on being uncomfortable around people who aren't your same skin color and then 
imparting and galvanizing that notion into another person who's trying to learn. Now, there's there's really, really no price you can put on systemic racism. Oh, did, sorry, did I say that phrase in this context? Sorry. Thank you. She's amazing, so. <laughs> it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like did my prep program prepare me for teaching in 2020? Uh, thank you, Drew W. Only one of these Nixon can easily pass as white. I, I don't. I don't care. I, I, honestly, I, I'm like looking down at my keyboard, just listening to all of this because I. I don't. I don't care what they look like. I'm just thinking. Uh, these are the words and the sen sentiments coming from people in charge of teaching young children. These are the focuses and the biases and the filters by which they move through the world and assess other people in the context of elementary school. I, oh, I, I, and, you know, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, admittedly, at this point in time, I should not be surprised by any of this. If any of you have watched any of my previous Curriculum of Fear ep episodes or anything, this shouldn't be surprising. But the, the thing that always gets me is that, you know, teachers aren't a monolith. These are individual people, individual people who are promoting this stuff to groups of children. And they're making the choice to operate in the world this way individually. And so each one to me is just another surprise, I suppose. Uh, thank you again, Midrin. Uh, so I am sure she has all of her non-Latinx male students transferred out of her class because she can't possibly teach them, right? Well, that, that would be the assumption I would have to make if she is really working in the world and, and, and assessing people on the basis of their femaleness and their coloredness. I, I can't even imagine what she does with someone who is either not female and or uh, white. What, what, what does she do with that person? How does she treat that kid? I, I don't know. I can only imagine but I can imagine quite a bit. And thank you again, Drew W., but only but one of them can pass as white. Uh, I suppose. If that matters. I mean, it matters to them. It doesn't matter to me, but I, yeah, I suppose. I, I don't know what... I. So then I got to wonder, like, well, what are the other people in this group thinking about the person who doesn't look like they belong? What do they do then? I don't know. No, not one bit. They prepared me for teaching in... 2001 yeah 2014 you know shout out to the 2000s like wait 21 through 2014 okay i, I don't know how teacher education where I'm, I'm sure it's an ongoing process but 12 years uh okay again maybe i'm I assume teachers continually have to take classes to keep up to date on what's going on and so on. So maybe that's what she's talking about. But she said she's been a teacher for only six years early on in this in this presentation. But she was doing teacher education from 2001 to 2014. Does, does that sound off? Or am I, maybe I'm missing something great times and they prepared me for teaching like i mentioned earlier teaching to the standards classroom management assessments yeah like i said you already answered this question earlier so there's not really much to talk about is there data tracking like holla at me i'm your girl uh -huh. but that was not teaching that's not what i realized when i got to the classroom classroom management that's not teaching Okay, so, okay, I'm going to continue. That is not saving me. <laughs> and the students were like, that doesn't matter here. <laughs> like, we're, we're the real deal. And they quickly schooled me in what I needed. And I was walking in with, like, this very white supremacist ideal of the classroom and what a teacher should be, very authoritarian. <sighs> you are the authority. You are the teacher. It is your classroom. It is your class. You are supposed to be the authority figure. So uh, lesson plans, classroom management, how to prepare a curriculum for your students and so on and, and teach, the, uh, teach the material and so on. Uh, this is not what you signed up for. You signed up for letting the students dictate the curriculum 
throwing out all the stuff they were actually teaching you and you just wanted the certificate to be able to go in and do your own thing. Okay. Uh, you know, I remember having like three different people in my building when I started my first year tell me, don't smile until after Christmas. And I was like, what does that even mean? Uh, if I were doing the bingo card, that'd be the point at which I'd be sort of anecdote that probably never happened. But who, who knows? There are a lot of stupid people in education who have some very, very silly ideas about how to educate kids. Obviously. Like, that sounds horrid. And they were like, well, you want them to respect you. These kids are wild. You can't smile until after Christmas. And I was like, I mean, I'm wild. Like, I'm a wild adult. Like, but I'm going to smile. And I, I feel like my prep program didn't prepare me for students that I experience and students that are in our world today, which are fierce young people who are coming up ready to fight and ready to make a difference. That is not your place as an educator. You are there to teach them how to think through things. Teach them facts, reading, writing, arithmetic, the basics. Get them ready for a Larger education in the future. You are an authority figure. You are meant to be an authority figure. You went to school to become an authority on something, presumably. That is not white supremacy. That is mentorship. Is, is every person you named as a mentor thus part of a white supremacist conspiracy? Because they are authority figures by your own estimation. What are you talking about? Seriously. And my prep program did not teach me to challenge my students. They did not teach me to give my students democratic power in the classroom. Oh, they didn't teach me to... Democratic power? <clears throat> okay, why are you even there? Why even show up? If you're on the same level as your fierce, wild children, if you're going to abdicate your position as a teacher to the children... Why even show up? Why even be there? Why even call yourself an educator? I mean, simply possessing that title puts you into the realm of authoritarianism, doesn't it? And that's bad, isn't it? Be a partner with my students in their learning journey. They uh, taught me that I'm up here and they're down here. And yep. that's the way it needs to stay until the standards are met. So... I learned all that. Honestly, I'm not going to say on my own, like I'm amazing. I just woke up and I was like, oh my God, this is the way it should be done. Uh, no, I, I can believe that you had some help along the way enforcing and galvanizing these thoughts as the right way to treat children as peers, as, as mental and social peers, your students, who you are there to teach and be a role model, and be an authority figure, and teach them structure, and reasoning, and so on. Oh, but that's all white supremacist thinking. Thank you, Chicago Mike. You're a teacher. It's not a democracy in the classroom. If she's teaching about how democracy works and has a lesson for that, fine. But after that's over with, it's her classroom. She's the teacher. She's in charge. She sets the agenda. She organizes classroom management in order to help kids learn, not to help them believe. So you I learned that, I mean, I am, but I learned this through experience. Like I learned it through colleagues, shout out to Tamasha Ahmedi. I learned it with colleagues, Claire Principe, people who I worked with in my first couple of years. I learned it from the colleagues I work with now. Shout out to my Mountain View peeps, Amelia Bowen, Aaron Enquist. Like I learn it every day from people who are like-minded individuals who are ready. Do you ever entertain any notions from people who aren't automatically like-minded? Do you ever challenge yourself? with perspectives or ideas that don't immediately align with what you think the world is just to just to make sure you're on an even keel with other perspectives or do you just exist in an echo chamber constantly reinforcing your notions about 
how you should treat other people and assess them and how you should assess education. I'm, I'm just curious. To bring our students together with us in this journey. So I, I did not feel prepared at all. If I'm looking at some data, yes. If your journey is not your student's business. Okay. Your students are not there to be an extension of your personal journey of self-discovery. That's, that's not how this is supposed to work. You are a teacher. You are not a guru. But that seems to be a lost distinction. I, I, I don't know. This is, this is really disturbing. If I'm looking at a student, no. Sorry, I want to back up a couple seconds there because uh, I kind of missed that last part. Let me, uh, let's see. Okay. Data, yes. If I'm looking at a student, no. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't go back far enough. Okay, let me. People who I worked with in my first couple of years, I learned it from the colleagues I work with now. Shout out to my Mountain View peeps, Amelia Bowen, Aaron Enquist. Like, I learn it every day from people who are like-minded individuals who are ready to bring our students together with us in this journey. So I, I did not feel prepared at all. If I'm looking at some data, yes. If I'm looking at a student, no. That's because people are not numbers and education can only tell you so much until you have to make it applicable to the real world. Th that is not mysterious. That is not uncommon. That is the norm. You can get all the book learning in the world as to, I don't know, how to uh, perform a surgery. You can, you can read about it. You can practice on a cadaver. And then there's having to do it in a hospital under emergency circumstances and the stress and the noise and everything else. That What did you expect the teacher education process was going to do? completely and totally fulfill you with all the possible knowledge and and uh, contingencies that, that could occur? What? what, what I, I can't even imagine what our speaker's expectation is of reality, let alone individual teachers. It's It just sounds very bizarre. Yeah, I, I kind of want to just like tag on to this question just because... Um... You know, I'm a teacher in 2022. Um, 2022? You're in the future? Or two is in two T-O-O. -O. I, I know. And, and what does being a teacher in 2020 have to do with anything? Does, does two plus two equal something else in 2020? <laughs> well, given what I'm seeing on Twitter these days, supposedly that might be the case. <laughs> So it, this really makes me think about something. Um, I think it was Gloria Lutz and Billings. I went to one of her talks uh, over here in White Center. It must have been like two years ago. Um, and she talked about how so often um, older educators or folks from older generation um, to begin with, anybody who's older, um, they so often say things like, well, you have it so good right now, or you have, um, we've made so much progress. Um, uh, well, it depends, I guess, on what you mean by progress. I mean, there was a time where racial segregation in the classroom as part of policy was a bad thing. At least as far as I recall. Oh, but now, now, you know, it's a good thing. So if you're going to say we've made progress in education, <laughs> I might disagree with you. Or are you about to say that we haven't made any progress? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. And the thing about that comment, and this is what Gloria Lutz and Billing says, is that what we fail to realize is that in 2001, um, kids who are like 9, 10, 11 year olds, and even those who are just born in 2001, their first experience with the world was 9 11. Uh, okay. So they came into a world that was already seeing violence from the get-go. Yeah, because prior to 9-11, there was no violence in the world, I guess. Um, and then we had the financial crisis. 
Yes. We had uh, the Black Lives Matter movement where we were starting to see, and we also had um, technology start to come to the forefront where we were uh, seeing uh, Black death being broadcasted uh, all over Facebook. Uh huh. Yes. Many monumental things have taken place in the last 20 years. I've, I've lived through all of it. And you know what? There was violence. <laughs> you know, one of my, my earliest experiences was, and I, and I guess you can't chalk this up to violence so much, but to uh, uh, death and destruction, uh, the Challenger exploding. I got to watch that live in my classroom. That, that was an experience when you're like a six-year-old or whatever I was. Yeah. And so young people are actually growing up in a world where they're seeing almost a decline in the way people treat each other and respect each other. Um, and no, no, they're seeing a broadcasting of individual incidents and being told this is how everybody thinks and everybody behaves. They're, they're having individual incidents that are being interpreted before all the facts are out, before everyone has had their chance to do their investigations and so on and so forth. And they're being told that this is how to interpret this. And by the way, this is reflective of everyone. Making assessments of people on the basis of what they look like, making grand assumptions about how the world works based on individual incidents. And you... From, the, from what it sounds like, are helping to embolden that notion. Just right now, this is how the world works. 9-11, totally a normal everyday thing. The financial crisis, well, that is a cyclical thing, if you look at history. It's not unique to our era. And everything else, yeah. Social media has done a lot to let a lot of people know about a lot of things going on in places that prior they wouldn't have known. And then they're being held up as the norm, as the standard. They're being interpreted and packaged before everybody has had a chance to figure out what's going on because it's all reflexive and based on emotion rather than thinking first and figuring out what's going on. You know, kind of like, I don't know, setting aside teacher education and wanting to focus more on race and white supremacy. And violence has definitely escalated on a global level. Violent crime is down in America. Year over year, violent crime has decreased in America. I can't speak for the rest of the world, obviously. I don't know. But no, you are saying it is, so it must be true, I guess, because you've taken these individual examples and individual incidents and said, this is the norm. And because you're hearing more about individual stories, you interpret that to be an increase in actual events rather than just a higher level of broadcasting of things. And so, it, you know, when I think about what Gloria Ladson Billings said, um, she was referencing from 2001 to now, right? Uh -huh. And that the 20 years that we're talking about in that time period feels like... Feels like? It happened so quickly. Feels like? And teacher ed programs have not kept up with it. Why should they? How, how does the art of educating people have to change because of what's going on in society. I'm not talking about the content. I'm talking about the method. Why does the method that has been practiced and refined and redefined over the centuries from freaking Socrates till now, why does the method, the core method, have to alter because of catastrophic world events? Why? Why? And uh, basically nobody has kept up with it, right? Except oh, 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 nobody has? Well, how are you sitting here? Oh, wait, you have a better idea? Oh, you know, you know better because of 9-11 how to teach kids today? What? For people who are in the movement work. Right. Got it. 
No one knows how to do teaching except those who are in the movement work. Anyone outside of the movement work is using old, antiquated, irrelevant methods to teach children. The correct way to teach children are those specifically involved in an ideological movement. Is that what I am to understand? Because that's what it sounds like you're saying. Um, so anyways, it just makes me think that really no teacher ed program has adequately prepared um, educators to be uh, teachers in this time period, but you know. No, 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 let's, let's correct ourselves. No teacher's education program has pushed the ideological agenda that you desire. It sounds like they are teaching the basics, the neutral basics of how to run a classroom, how to teach, how to set a lesson plan, the methodology. You want the ideology. You don't care about the method. You care about the outcome, a specific outcome, your personally preferred outcome. That's not education. That's indoctrination. Uh, thank you again, Midran. Uh, it has to alter, obviously, because people should never be uncomfortable or deal with adversity since that hurts these precious fifis. Or, and, you know, forgive me for, for saying so, maybe we continue teaching in an effective way even if terrible things are happening. Maybe there are some core values to how education should operate that should not be altered because of terrorism or because of crisis. Maybe world events shouldn't scare us into radically changing how we see the world or operating on emotion rather than logic and reason in education of all things. Maybe I'm just being radical. Okay, guys, we're coming up on the second hour. I'm kind of inclined to continue. Uh, so I'm going to. Again, for those of you listening at home, those of you live with me, if, if this is getting boring too much, it'll be here if you want to continue it later. I'm still curious to see where this is going to go. So I'm going to go on for, <laughs> I don't know, maybe just another half an hour. So we'll see. We'll see. I. It's one of those things where I never know what they're going to say next, and I can't help but be curious. I'll, I will also say shout out to Western because uh, ESJ and Vettel and, you know, Kristen and everybody. But anyways. <laughs> okay, whose webinar is this? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is paid for by Western. I'm just kidding. It's literally not. <laughs> It literally is not. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> um, and to the oh, person so much for money for the, the, the you about, her name is Gloria Ladson Billings. Yeah, Gloria Ladson Billings. And this person sounds like someone who, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure she belongs amongst your cohort. Um, so this kind of leads me into my next question, right? Yeah. Uh, I guess it does. What is the, what is the next question? And please, please don't tell me. It is simply a restatement of something you've already covered and or asked because the last one kind of was. Young kids who were, let's say, four or five years old, they were moving into uh, 2001. Uh, what? 9-11. Oh, sorry, I'm going to back up. I, I cut her off right before she started there. And I, I'm, I'm very curious to know why we're going back to 9-11 again. For, let's say, four or five. Oh, sorry. No, I, okay. It's hard for me to estimate how much time I need here. Her name is Gloria Ladson Billings. Okay. Yeah, Gloria Ladson Billings. Um, so this kind of leads me into my next question, right? Young kids who are, let's say, four or five years old, they were moving into uh, 2001, 9-11. Uh, okay. Going through major experiences uh -huh. of violence and seeing death on TV. Yeah. Um, right now, elementary school kids are seeing those same things. Um, they're also seeing racism. They're seeing anti-Black violence. They're seeing um, um, anti-Muslim racism. They're what? seeing so many things that are really hard to process, even as adults. Are they seeing them because you know they're seeing them? Or are they seeing them because you assume they're seeing them? You don't have any thought that maybe 
parents of four to five year olds are policing what their children are exposed to? Or are you exposing these kids to those things? I, I just have to ask because I'm trying to think of like four and five year olds who are watching the news every day. And I get it. Uh, you know, I, I, I've seen like two or three year olds running around with mom's smartphone watching cartoons on Netflix. So I don't I don't have any illusions that young kids today can't get into material that maybe they shouldn't. Just like kids of yesteryear would do the same thing just without the electronic devices and things. All the same, four and five year olds. Uh, do you really think they're doing nothing but watching police shootings all the time? So my question to you all is, can young kids handle these conversations? Can they? This is an instance where I, should, I would say, should they? Is it, is it an inevitability you're going to, you as the teacher are going to approach your students with this material? Why? Why is that your realm? Why? Why would you want to expose young children to conversations about violence and death? Is that really your place as an elementary school educator? This is so disturbing. I mean hands down <laughs> hell yeah they can <laughs> like and you're laughing about this talking to children about racial violence and death and you're laughing about this they really can and there is research out there tons of research out there that talks about as young as now i can't quote any of the research like i know it's out there but i'm gonna quote it all wrong but like you know what's out there. You're going to quote it all wrong. <laughs> okay, well, then I, I I guess that's good enough for government work or something. Like, super, super young babies. I'm talking like young kids. What? Do recognize race and ethnicities, and they realize that stuff. <sighs> Pattern recognition, sure. How do you think they assess those things as babies, other than simply a visual difference? Is it a visual difference or is it a value assessment in babies, do you think? And so I feel like, not that I'm going to be out there preaching to nine-month-old babies, like, you know, get with the movement, y'all, but like... That is exactly what you are... Nine months old, three or four years old. What effectively is the difference, might I ask? Jeez. And yet you bring up, that's the example you bring up. Well, I'm not going to be preaching to nine-month-olds. Oh, well, why not? I mean, they can already recognize race, right? So they're already ready to get into the movement. Might as well get them while they're really young. Thank you, Lady Gopher, for the bowing dog cat fox. Very respectful. Thank you, dog cat fox. And thank you, Lady Gopher. We know that that stuff is happening and they are taking it in. And so I feel like it's really important for us. It's really impor important for you to interpret that on your assumptions of what it should be in their minds and tell them how they are to assess those things. As teachers, not as parents, as teachers. Down to that pre-K level and elementary school to have these types of conversations with these kiddos because it's in the world around them. And no matter how hard we try and shelter them or hide them from it, it's still out there. Are you, are you trying to shelter them from it? It doesn't sound like you're trying to shelter them from anything. It sounds like you're trying to introduce them to it. It sounds like you are wanting to talk to them about these things, that you are wanting to frame their perspective on these things through your own ideological lens. Because you are laughing quite enthusiastically about having these conversations with these kids just a moment ago. So 
Are you doing anything to focus on education and filter out the evils of the world? Or are you wanting to expose these kids to the evils of the world and tell them how to think about them? I'm getting some mixed messages here. And when we do that and when we shelter them from those things, it's a harsher reality when they get to the point where they are able to understand or mature enough to understand. Then why expose it to them before they're ready for it? And why is it your place to do so? I, I mean, do they understand it at nine months or do they understand it when they're mature enough to handle it? Which is it? And all that aside, why is it your job to man manage that stuff? You are not the parent. You are not the guru. You are the educator. You're not the life coach. You're not the priest. Thank you, Chicago Mike. At what point does your job as a teacher end and let their parents job begin? It begins. Yeah. Yeah. Where is the line? Why are we not talking about parents here? I, I, at no point in this, and I and I, I I'm I'm happy to be corrected by anybody who's been listening to this in more more uh, more focus than I have bit by bit. At no point has any of these speakers mentioned parents, as mentioned home life. I mean, the closest we got maybe was our speaker here talking about abuse and or homelessness of her students, which. I mean, it's an extension of their home life, obviously. But other than that, have they ever mentioned the role of parents in this dynamic? It seems as though they are islands unto themselves and the students are the castaways. And so I feel like there definitely is a way to go about it. I'm not saying you're going to lay this on, you know, seven and eight year olds the same way you might have this conversation in a high school 11th grade classroom. Should you have it at all? I'm still asking, should. Our, our, our leader here asked, can you? I'm asking, should you? But they can have these conversations and they want to have these conversations. They do? They do, really? They want to? You're not trying to convince anybody, are you? Notice in the classroom is... They feel so empowered when you talk to them, like the tiny humans they are. Like <sighs> they are young people. Y yes, thank you. They are young people, young, impressionable people. And you are not their shepherd. And I feel like, yes. You feel like. Yes. You can have these conversations with them, and you should. You, okay, well, you should. You should. Why should you? I, I hope you get to that part. I have a feeling you're going to end it there, but at least you mentioned the word. This is like my favorite argument against ethnic studies, to be honest. Because, what? Because it's like so, like, it's just, it's even not rooted in like, scholarly research that is upheld, like white scholarly research that's upheld by our society, if you think about it. because I, I'm thinking about a lot of things right now, but mostly I'm trying to think about how to understand what you're saying. I'm back up a little bit because I cut her off. Argument against ethnic studies, to be honest, because it's like so, like, it's just, it's even not rooted in like scholarly research that is upheld, like white scholarly research that's upheld by our society, if you think about it. Because developmentally, kids are in, first off, that critical period where learning is like, especially, you know, I teach kindergarten and first grade, but also developmentally, they're in the overgeneralizing stage. So, and this is where like prejudices and racism can just grow and grow and grow if we don't like nip it in the bud there. So your kindergarten and first graders are just proto-racists unless you step in to teach them how it is from someone who cheers on affinity groups.
someone who is going to differentiate scholarship by skin color, you're going to step in and nip the nascent racism and discrimination in the bud for these kindergarten and first graders. You're going to be the one doing that. Thank you again, Midrin. Uh, wait, she differentiates between scholarly research and white scholarly research? Alrighty then. Exactly. Like I said, th this, this is the mindset that's going to stop impressionable children from becoming racists, everyone. Because kids want, I mean, kids developmentally overgeneralize the world, you know? And so if we don't counteract those overgeneralizations with the truth and the facts. The truth and the facts. Tell me the truth of scholarship as divided by skin color. I, I would love to know what that means. It's just going to fester and fester and fester. And that, and I'm talking about for our white students, I always tell my uh, white parents, I'm like, yeah, they need this too, because my job is to make them a great white ally. I'm going to narrate my actions for a second. I'm taking off my headphones. I'm, I'm placing them down on my desk. I'm slowly standing up from my desk and walking away because I need a second. I'm now on the other side of the room, hands in my pockets, kind of pacing around in a small circle because I really just heard that. You know, I, I'd sort of been, I'd been generalizing to this point about what teachers, maybe these teachers specifically see their roles in education as. And fortunately or unfortunately, our, uh, our speaker here has just made it very plain. She has made it very plain. And she's the one who's going to nip in the bud notions of racism and discrimination in her young kids. She is telling her white parents that her job is to make white allies. It, it's moments like this why I started calling this series Curriculum of Fear. N not only the kind of fear I feel listening to stuff like this, but also the fear being imparted by educators who operate like this. Um, and then also for our students of color, like you heard in like definitely in my story and then in probably other stories too, um, you know, internalized racism, internalized overgeneralizations, internalized prejudice, internalized discrimination. Yeah. Overgeneralization. White kids need to be taught to be allies. Internalized discrimination. White kids need to be treated differently than other kids. Affinity groups. You know, that kind of stuff. Um. And so I just, I, I always love that argument because I'm like, hmm, like even scientifically, like just like not even related to like race, like this is the stage where we need to correct those overgeneralizations that can just create so much harm for them and others. Yes. In order to correct the overgeneralizations that these kids might adopt at kindergarten through first grade, second grade, we need to impart on them a perspective of racial evaluation of themselves, of others, in order to avoid internalized racism or discrimination or generalization so they know the correct way to think and can become appropriate allies based on their skin color.
For sure. And just they're living in it and it doesn't make sense for us to ignore it in the classroom and it makes it's so detrimental to not mention it because the growing up in going to school and feeling um, not intelligent enough because I didn't understand what was going on in the classroom, but then I go home and like have to translate for my mom for calling the doctor and doing things. And I'm like, well, I don't know what that means it's in English. <laughs> I've never heard it in Spanish either. Um, and what? 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 I... Okay. The phrase non sequitur comes to mind just then. But okay. And so make making sure that they do that we are teaching them with the reality of things and then preparing them to live in this uh society where this society which you have already interpreted as inherently white supremacist and racist. Prepare them for the reality that you say is true. they they just need to know the truth in order to change it as well i remember um i was really nervous last year at the end of my i was i had a very good mentor uh mr cueto in bellingham and uh what was he of the appropriate skin color I, I i don't know why i'm asking that question since it seems to be the running theme of this deal um and so he he let me do anything. He was like, go for it. And so we did units about refugees. And his wife, Dr. Cueto, um, who was also my professor, um, helped me with the books because she is in this big literacy committee where she just reviews a tons of books. And she, um, I in her class, I saw books that I had never seen in my entire life. And I was 22. And I was just, these kids need to read these books. I needed to read these books. You know, I walk into a bookstore once in a while and I see books I've never seen before. It's called Most of Them. I don't know what she's talking about. Uh, thank you, formerly Rod Line. This is why I contacted my school district, question their curriculum. I will not let my child be indoctrinated. I, I am all for parents taking an active role in their child's education. You know, I mean, there, I'm, I'm sure there's some line somewhere uh, between being, you know, overly policing what's going on with your kid and being having a health healthful uh, connection to it. But um, like the previous speaker, if her quote unquote white parents are just deferring their role in the process or abdicating their child's education to this lady's white ally perspective, I, I, I fear for the children involved because they're stuck in the middle of parents who apparently are going apparently are going to step back from their responsibilities and a ideologue who's going to step into that role and the kids caught in the middle. Uh, think of Chicago Mike, whose truths? That's that's the other part. I'm going to teach them the truth through the eyes of an ideologue. Um, and they talk about things like power, racism, and all those sort of things that they're out there and I just didn't know and I would have benefited from it. You found books that talked about power and racism you didn't know existed, and yet somehow you had gotten to the point of becoming a teacher anyway? Even though you talked at length about racism and power in your own growing up and educational experience prior to all that, but you didn't know there were books on those subjects prior to college? What? But then also asking my mentors, like, when is it a good time? Um, how do I know if I'm not being too radical? Because I'm, I'm, I want a job. I don't want to get fired. And then... But, okay. If you have to ask yourself if you're being too radical, I got a hint for you. You're being too radical. It's it's like being a little pregnant. So my mentors were just like, you know, scope it out, uh, talk to people, see what they're doing. And yeah, see how much more covertly you can insinuate these possibly detrimental ideas into your curriculum, you know, to sort of keep it on the down low and see what's permitted. And 
you know, frog in the heating up pan of water kind of thing. Eventually you'll get it boiling. You know, you just, just keep at it just a little bit at a time. You know, wedge theory, a little bit at a time. Like when in doubt, just go for it, but then also just take your measures. And that always like made me sad. So just like take your measures because I, at the end of the day, I still felt like I, I was suppressing, I would have been suppressing some part of myself if I wasn't teaching to what I wanted to. Teaching what you wanted to. What you wanted to. Not what the school was trying to teach. Not what the class you're in charge of was meant, there, meant to teach. What you wanted to. Okay, if you're in first or, or K through second grade or whatever, reading, writing, arithmetic, the basics, that is what you teach. What you want to teach beyond the basics is not your choice. If you want to go into far more nuanced subject matter, then become a college professor on something. And then at least then the students can elect to take your class or not. But K through two, second grade, what you want to teach. Just because I wanted a job. Oh, um, yeah. And then I remember the first topic that came up, I was reading a book about communities and it talked about police and how um, help the community and then it just felt so wrong to just read the book and then go off and not say anything so because police don't help communities where are you going with this i and then i stopped and paused and i was like okay yeah this is what their job's meant to be but they don't always do that especially in our communities people of color because Synovia and I teach in a very diverse community where... Where you need to teach the kids not to trust police? Is, is, is that what you want to teach? Majority of the school is Latinx. The whole school is on free and reduced lunch. So they... Latinx. Right. They know these things. They've seen them in encounters with police and have felt the same fear that we probably feel uh, have felt growing up and things, not knowing it. Um, so it's better to tell them. It's it's better to galvanize fear in them about police. Okay. And they're aware of it. And I remember texting Synovia right after. I'm like, I just talked about police brutality. Do you think that's okay? <laughs> I'm going to stop there, guys. I'm going to stop on that notion. I just taught about police brutality. Do you think that's okay? With a big smile and laugh. To, I assume, K through second grade students. I'm going to pause on that frame right there. Because of all the things we've listened to so far, I think that little bit right there kind of encompasses the totality of what I'm afraid of here. As she's wearing a shirt that says unafraid. Laughing in nervous joy and excitement over exposing small children to ideas far afield of anything that they really need to be paying attention to as small children. Not because they need to, but because these ideologues want to. So I'll give the last uh, several minutes before we get to the bottom of the hour for you guys. If you have anything you'd like to add or say, uh, put in the chat now. Um, uh, if you'd like to see more of this, uh, the link to the original is in the description below. Again, I started my portion of this at about eight minutes into the original recording because they were doing a bunch of pre 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 setup and everything. Uh, so everything from that point onward is effectively what we've watched. And so add on eight minutes to uh, 45 minutes. So that'd be 53 minutes. So about 53 minutes into the original recording is about where we are, if you'd like to listen further on from where we've already been. Uh, so there's your timestamp. 
Uh, Ryan Rollins, Scribelite, the stream was rigged from the start and my brain curses you, it hurts. Uh, you know, so, so in my mind, some things just need to be listened to, even if it is difficult, because I want to know. I, I want to know. And you have uh, four different educators here. Uh, now, admittedly, from one part of the world currently, or they're all teaching in one part of the world, but they're all from very different backgrounds and different areas of education and different schools, but they all arrived at the same spot. Very disturbing. Uh, Renovatio Scribelite, this will be fine in the end. All the white kids will be given a yellow star for participation in a trip to a train of color to a special camp made just for them. I've seen this one before. <sighs> God. Oh, man. I'm going to need to do something fun after this. This has been... This has been a slog. This has been an emotional slog. Zemgo is Scribelite. So basically this sums up to, quote, we want any kid we teach to be as afraid as we are of the laws we are to abide and the law enforcement we have presently, unquote. It's teaching their dogma. It's imparting their belief system onto impressionable kids and completely dismissing the role of parents and in fact trying to bring the parents in to nod and agree with what they're doing. You know, talking to my white parents, letting them know my job is to teach white kids to be good white allies. That's their role. So, Chicago might scribe, right now I'm sober and I wish I wasn't. Well, I, I've been sober this whole time, just for your reference. It was a bit too early in the morning <laughs> for a pepper jack. And uh, so I came into this uh, uh, dry, as it were, uh, Mike R., I'm really enjoying this live stream. Please go 15 minutes more. Scribe light. No, Mike, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I've reached my limit. Uh, two and a half hours is more than enough for me. And uh, honestly, I think probably more than enough for the stream. Uh, again, if, if, you, if you'd like to listen to more for yourself, and I'd be, I, I'm, I'm more than curious to find out if anybody does uh, and here's anything else of interest, uh, be sure to leave it in the comments uh, just, just for my own uh, curiosity's sake. Uh, thank you, formerly Rod Line. If anyone wants to know where this kind of curriculum comes from, look up Castle Company and SEL Learning System. So C A S E L Company and S E L Learning System. Uh, never heard of it, but I'll uh, I'll, I'll take a look when I get a chance. Uh, L Wolf Scribelite. They made my head hurt. Yeah, well, they made my head hurt. They made my heart hurt. And you know, ultimately, I'm more like. My concern is more for what's going to happen to the kids involved in this equation. What are they being taught? What are they being led to believe? What are their parents taking a step back and allowing to occur? <sighs> uh, Ebony Williams, this is concerning to say the least. Yeah, I at, at the very, very high level, I'd say that. I'd say that. Uh, J. Willie series or J. Wild series? Sorry. Uh, that is not their role. The role of the education system is that my kids can get a job and have their own families so that my own people keep existing. Uh, I mean, as if you mean by your own people, your 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 family line or whatever, but uh, no, it's it's not what what these what these educators have been describing is not their job. it's 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 their passion. it's it's their ideology. They want to teach what they want to teach, not what these kids need to be taught the basics, how to think, not what to think. And that's the line they're crossing. That's the line they are enthusiastic to cross. Uh, thank you, Mike R., so much for the dog, cat, fox. Good job. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Zeogo at Scribelite, the 40K universe is a better place to live and compared to the world that these teachers are trying to create, and that's saying something. I, I, I know very little. I only know a very peripheral amount about 40K from uh, college. Uh, but, uh, yeah, in, in the grim, dark future of, of the universe, there is only war or something like that. Uh, Zemgo, ascribe, I feel bad for any kid that doesn't believe what their teacher is telling them in this situation, but either they have to keep their head low and make non-committal nods or leave. Yeah, anything else shows their white fragility, I guess. 
Uh, Mike Savage, that is why so many teachers were scared their, that parents were seeing what the kids were being taught via Zoom teaching. I was, was there something on that? Maybe I missed that. Was there some story or something about uh, teachers trying to keep their their meetings private? I mean, and, and let me just say something. I am, I am so grateful, and I don't mean this facetiously. I am so grateful that this is public broadcast here, that this was put onto uh, the uh, YouTube channel for the Washington Education Association. I'm glad this is here. I am glad this is not off in a secret cabal somewhere, even though I'm sure things like this happen beyond the purview of the public. I'm glad this is here. I'm glad to know that this is what some teachers are talking about, what some teachers are pushing forward. And that unfortunately, by their own testimony, that where they're coming from on this, they are not alone in pushing, that they got this from their own mentors, that there's a whole network out there of teachers who think along these lines. I am glad to know it. Doesn't make me happy, doesn't brighten my day, but I'd rather know than not. So if there's any benefit, maybe that's it. But guys, everyone, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for sticking it out with me, those of you that have for the last couple hours. I really do appreciate it. Uh, if you'd like to hear more from me or The Ranting Monkey or Satsu Two Cents, you can find all three of us tomorrow night, Monday night, on Satsu Two Cents' channel at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern for The Lords of the Night, where we will talk about the news of the day, news stories that you submit, what we've been up to on the internet, and then your questions and comments. Uh, again, everyone, thank you for coming out with me for this one. Uh, thank you so much for your attendance, your participation, and thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your generosity. You guys have been ridiculously generous today. Uh, I will be paying that forward, as they say, uh, very shortly here. Um, uh, either way, guys, I hope you have a good rest of your Sunday. If you're lucky enough to have tomorrow off for the holiday, have a good holiday. If you're not, have a good Monday otherwise. Please, I hope you're all safe and well. If you're not well, please get well soon. And I'll see you on the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.